Namaskar. I am Neetha Shree, a senior journalist, welcoming you all today to the launch of the much awaited and may I say much needed book Sanskrit non-translatables the importance of sanskritizing english dear ladies and gentlemen suswagatam this event is presented to you by infinity foundation jiva institute of vedic studies bhishma school of indic studies and amaryllis publishers and what makes this event a one of a kind is that the launch will be followed by a stimulating discussion with the illustrious authors of the book shri rajiv malhotra ji and shri satya narayana das baba ji who will be in conversation with yet another equally talented thought leader tohin sena tohin is an author himself and a popular face on the prime time tv debates now our august audience need no introduction at all if i were to read out their achievements the list is so long we would perhaps require another episode yet i'd like to briefly touch upon their work Rajiv ji is a world renowned researcher author speaker and public intellectual on contemporary issues that relate to civilization spirituality and science Rajiv ji founded Infinity Foundation in Princeton USA in 1994 and has conducted original research in several fields influencing thinkers scholars and general public worldwide he left his full time work to focus on philanthropy research and public service his work includes the battle for sanskrit breaking india being different indra's net and academic hindophobia a co-author satyanarayana dasa baba ji holds a phd he is a vaishnava scholar and practitioner he is the founder of jiva institute of vedic studies which promotes vedic culture philosophy and ayurveda through education He has authored many books related to Indian culture and philosophy, and several important publications in many prestigious journals. He serves as the visiting professor of the State University of New Jersey, Rutgers, and the American Hindu University. He has been honored by the former President of India, the late Dr. Pranab Mukherjee, for his extraordinary contribution towards presenting Vedic culture worldwide. Thank you. to the both of you for joining us today and for undertaking this urgent and essential book dear listeners and viewers today is a very important occasion you are standing at the point in time where you start making history with the help of this paradigm altering plan of action which has been undertaken by rajiv ji and baba ji this book sanskrit non translatables is a path breaking attempt at an audacious endeavor at sanskritizing the english language and enriching it with powerful sanskrit words this is not just a book it's a movement today is a significant occasion because we have some very important dignitaries who have dedicated dedicated their lives to the dharmic cause and have so kindly agreed to bless the book we are very lucky to have thousands of people joining us today through multiple platforms on which the event is being uh, streamed live and without much ado may i please welcome our luminous chief guest his holiness swami govind dev giri ji padma bhushan dr vijay bhatkar and sar sanchalak of the rashtriya swamsevak sangh shri mohan bhagwat ji i request his holiness swami govind dev giri ji to launch the book his holiness swami govind dev giri ji is the trustee and treasurer of shri ram janmabhoomi teeth kshetra He has been working for the cause of Vedic Sanskrit and the spread of dharma, yoga, Vedic education, and karma yoga. It is an honor that Sanskrit non-translatables will be launched today by him. वर्णा अर्थसंघा रसा छंदसा मंगला चकर्तारो वंदे वाणी विनायको फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई फील वेरी फॉर्चुनेट 
to release this very very important book sanskrit untranslatable published by infinity foundation and written by shri rajiv ji malhotra and shri satyanarayan ji das baba ji it is today being released for the public at large friends this book was very much awaited personally by me because for last more than 45 years i have been delivering discourses on our sanskruti our dharma and our bharat rashtra while talking in english i could not translate those ideas which are given in our language sanskrit or all indian languages how to translate the word dharma was a problem for me how to translate the word sanskar was a problem for me how can we translate shraddha or how can we translate the word that occurs in the shraddha pind pind cannot be called rice ball and therefore i was very much anxious to have such a book because i always felt that the meaning in our words cannot be translated in any word from any other language which does not have the same sanskruti the same tradition dharma cannot be religion sanskruti cannot be culture how to translate sanskar it was a problem for me and therefore i congratulate both the writers that they have come ahead and taken up the challenge and not only they took the challenge but they have given the right reply really speaking our sanskrit language and not only the language but the whole bharat rashtra the indian nation is being invaded by people outside they want to break it they want to destabilize it and therefore we must be aware how it is done the genocide the cultural genocide which is being tried must be given a reply i congratulate and i felicitate rajiv ji malhotra who has come ahead to lead as an intellectual warrior and therefore i have got a great regard for him friends our sanskrit language as sant gulabrao maharaj whom i regard the highest saint under the sun in the whole tradition he used to say sanskrit is mantra language and english is yantra language our language has got the base of mantras and the english language has got the base of yantras the machines its mechanical and our language has got its source in the final consciousness the par brahman this is the richest language so far as the culture is concerned literature is concerned the bhartiya sanskruti indian tradition is concerned and therefore the attempt that have been made to inject the poison of hindu phobia must be 
warded off. And for that, such efforts are required. This book shall be very, very useful for all those who honestly desire to study Indian culture from abroad and also for those who are living in India but are the children of Mekal assisting and this timely book is a very good reply to them, very good food for them, very speaking Sanskritization of English shall enrich English language. Even the English people now worldwide using the word Guru. This is one small example because what Guru implies cannot come in the word teacher. In the same way, so many Sanskrit terms, if they are used as they are in English language, English language shall also be enriched, no doubt. This book shall be useful not only for the Indian youth or the Indian youth outside India, but also for our foreigner brothers and sisters who want to know Bharat as it is really. And at this golden moment, I again congratulate both the writers and say that these efforts will lead us to make our nation the highest in the world, to make the whole world peaceful. Thank you. Thank you. It is an absolute honor and good luck to have His Holiness Swami Govind Dev Giriji's invaluable blessings for the book. Abhar and Dhanavad. May I now request Padma Bhushan, Dr. Vijay Bhatkar, the Chancellor of Nalanda University, to also launch the book. His pioneering efforts in the development of the Param, Param supercomputers and his transformative leadership is at the helm of many central and technological institutions of India including the Center for Development of Advanced Computing and Indian Institute of Technologies. May I now request Dr. Sahab to please say a few words. Book by Raju Malhotra and Satyanara and Das Babaji has been a great eye-opener for me. In fact, I have been looking for such a book myself for a long time. See, I learned about the Vedanta or uh, Indian philosophy in a certain sense from a guru called Guru Arya Sakre Maharaj. He is very famous for the, his articulations and his commentaries on Bhagavad Gita. So learning from a guru is a, quite, is a entirely different experience. And I'm very happy that had I not learned from a guru who understands the true significance of each word which we articulate or which we express this one, we will never understand the core of our philosophy. I come from, as I am a student of science and most of the scientific tools and science books or science texts are in English language. And uh, we, having studied English, it so happens that if I am interested in philosophy, if I am interested in, say, any Indian concept or Bharatiya concept, I will learn it through the English language. And I have found a tremendous difference between what the books said and what actually they meant. And this happens in all branches of Indian philosophy. For example, the common uh, misunderstanding is in yoga. So yoga, the word itself is so profound that it cannot be translated at all. So we have been using, we have assimilated that word yoga. That is correct. Similarly, Om. Om is the beginning and the end of Indian philosophy. Not in the city. Is, uh, 
no beginning and no end of Indian philosophy in that sense, so on. And that cannot be translated as Amin, which you say in English language, you will take like this. Prana, the concept like Prana, which is not, which is, which uh, in everyday expression or in the books, or even the text books are translated, is translated as breath. Prana is not breath. And that leads to a fundamental misunderstanding about the many things. Guru, Guru is not teacher. Guru is much more profound word. I think unless we understand, the, I think the, the core of that word Guru, we cannot understand what is the role of teacher. So there are so many words um, in uh, English language and in Sanskrit language. If you see the, I think if you have to count the vocabulary of English language as appears in the dictionary, it will be 175,000 words or more, whatever it is. This one, there are different, different count, different ways of counting. Sanskrit has almost infinite words. So how do you transform infinite? And I can mathematically prove, and I was just going through the interpretation of that graph. You can generate almost infinite words. And, and that is the profoundness of uh, our, I think we ourselves, because we are, ourselves are infinite in the graphic. Uh, so each said has to be a different, and Sanskrit can have different words. Sanskrit has different words for morning, for evening, and many things which I say. So in that sense, there are uh, mapping finite words, uh, mapping infinite words into, into a finite set of words is, is almost a, when there are many words will remain non-translatable. I think that is not the issue. The issue of uh, this book, Sanskrit Non-Translatables, uh, is a very core issue that, um, uh, and we must accept that. And uh, this, this has to be accepted when you go to the core of understanding philosophy, particularly why it is important for, for us, for Indians or for uh, Hindus or whatever the, uh, is important because we try to understand our philosophy reading English books. And that's what I have done. So one thing is that uh, I think the, the very, very philosophy uh, then we uh, to understand that that uh, uh, English has to be enriched. I think one the, the case of uh, Raji Malhotraji and uh, Satyanarayan Das Babaji are making is that English must and it is English has accepted. I think English has worked for, for many languages. And it, it got enriched in that process, not correctly, but uh, it has embraced many words. So as time is there, I think that it's very important that uh, this philosophy is so profound. And uh, many people are interested now in Hindu philosophy or uh, Indian philosophy and uh, Indian understanding of the concept of dharma. For example, the word dharma itself cannot be translatable. The concept like as a religion, it is not religion. So uh, uh, I think Raju Ji Malavatra has been, I think, has taken up this case head on in this book, uh, and it's like a combat. And he has he has made a case that these are non-translatable words and they must be as adopted as it is and understood and as as they are. And then only we'll go to the core of understanding. Uh, so this problem has come, even an understanding of our own philosophy through English books. I think that's what we teach. We teach our Indian philosophy or in, I think on many, many universities. And, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, this can be utterly wrong. So uh, this book has opened my eyes. It will open everybody's eyes because it's bringing the core issues to the fore. So all uh, this has been brought together in one table, in, in, in the tabular form, in the graphical form, so that uh, the Western audiences or we as a scientific audiences can understand. The, and this can be eye-opening for us. We ourselves will understand deeply our own culture or our own philosophies uh, if we read this book, Sanskrit uh, Non-Translatables. And um, this is a case, I think this is a, it will be for uh, Western audience or especially oriented uh, readers or um, critics. This, this, is a, this will come as a shock. This will come, it will also, to many people it will come as a shock. And, it, uh, and, uh, and reading this book itself, we will start understanding that what it is not, that word what it is not, we will understand through this book and what it what truly means. And then is a case for going deeper into the delving deep into our own uh, uh, great philosophy and uh, the Vedanta and, uh, and yoga and many, uh, there are several uh, branches of our philosophies which can be interpreted in many, many ways. For example, the concept of Pancha Mahabhuta, like we have been translated in English. So we, we, we uh, the word is just utterly translated wrongly. Each has Mahabhuta as a great meaning and how the whole, I think the universe gets constructed to the Pancha Mahabhuta. 
and that cannot be understood by just a word by word translation which we have been doing so so uh, this book it must be read by all particularly those who are interested I mean, the indians also i'm taking are interested to understand our own culture deeply our own philosophy deeply and i think truly and uh, will revisit uh, on our own understanding and how profound our uh, think philosophy is uh, to uh, to understand the nature of reality which is the with the main subject of philosophy so uh, I, i think so it has been eye opener for me everybody should read this book i think those who are interested particularly our students or teachers and those who are interested in both uh, we reading through english language must understand read this book and then of course that will open up many doors for them and as it has opened for me so i congratulate uh, raju ji raju malhotra and also satyarayan ji that i not met him baba ji i not met him but uh, wonderful book so congratulations true dr bhatkar ji people in the west and in india as well will be able to understand our own roots more wholesomely and truthfully thank you dr bhatkar ji it is encouraging to have you lord the book may i now request sar sang chalak of the rashtriya swam sevak sang shri mohan bhagwat who is perhaps the most followed heard and looked up to leader of modern india to say a few words about the book through his work mentoring counsel and leadership he has guided thousands of indians to think beyond the self bolile ji roshi tach bhave varta hoya dadu santache marg adarane bhagle jag arthe lopali purane ghat kela shabd jnane ye marathi bhasha mein श्री तुकाराम महाराज जी नाम के जो संत हो गए उनका वचन है वो कहता है कि शब्द का ज्ञान केवल शब्द का ज्ञान उसके पीछे जो उसके अर्थ की अनुभूति और वह वह अर्थ प्रत्यक्ष जीवन में कैसे चलता है उसका आचरण ये नहीं है इसलिए अर्थों के बारे में जो भ्रम हो गया कंफ्यूजन हो गया उसके चलते बहुत गड़बड़ी हुई उसको ठीक करने के लिए संत अवतार लेते हैं शब्दों का इतना महत्व है क्योंकि शब्दों के पीछे भावना और विचार का विश्व होता है और मेरा भा, मेरी भावना मेरा विचार जो है उसको मुझे आपको पहुंचाना है तो माध्यम शब्द ही है गलत शब्द उपयोग करने से गलत बात पहुंचती है उसके गलत परिणाम होते हैं हमारे अपने देश में अपने देश की जो भाषा है अपने देश का जो वातावरण है अपने देश की जो रीति रिवाज है पूरा जीवन है उसको विदेशी लोगों ने देखा उन्होंने उसको अपनी आंखों से देखा और उनकी जैसी बुद्धि थी वैसा समझे वो हम जो समझ कर कर रहे थे वैसा उन्होंने नहीं किया एक आदमी को पूछा कि लक्ष्मी जी कमल में रहती है विष्णु क्षीर सागर में शयन करते हैं और शिव जी कैलाश पर बर्फीली चोटी पर रहते हैं ऐसा क्यों है अब वो कोई कवि नहीं था जो बड़ी बड़ी उपमाएं देकर और इन बातों के कारण बड़े काव्य रम्य कारण बता था ऐसा वो नहीं था वो तो एकदम सामान्य व्यक्ति था उसको सामान्य जीवन का सामान्य अनुभव था तो एकदम उसके मन में आया उसने बोल दिया कि शायद उनके घर में खटमल बहुत हुए होंगे इसलिए वहां रहते ऐसे आदमी अपने दिमाग से अपने दृष्टि से जो देखता है उसका विचार करता और निष्कर्ष निकालता है वैसा विदेशियों ने हमारे देश को देखकर उनका अपना जो अनुभव था अपना जो विचार विश्व था उसके लिए आवश्यक निष्कर्ष निकाले जो उसके उपयुक्त तो हुए उसका वो बार बार प्रचार करते रहे और उनके विरोध में जो आए उसको उन्होंने दबा दिया यानी न जानने के कारण गड़बड़ी हुई उससे भी ज्यादा हमको सदैव आत्मविस्मृत रखने के लिए 
अपनी सत्ता का और विश्व भर के प्रभाव का उपयोग करके एक वातावरण बनाना था उसके लिए उस उल्टे वातावरण को बनाने के लिए उन्होंने इसका उपयोग किया और दुर्भाग्य से हमने अपनी भाषा को उनके प्रभाव में छोड़ दिया तो उसके चलते बहुत सारी गड़बड़ियां हुई और हमारे देश को समाज को राष्ट्र को सनातन काल से चलती आई हुई हमारी धर्म संस्कृति को तोड़ने के प्रयासों में हम ही लोग साधन बनने लगे क्योंकि हम भाषाएं भूले हमको एक दूसरे की बात समझ में नहीं आई हमको अपनी बात समझ में नहीं आई और हमको अपनी बात समझ में ना आए इसलिए उस बात को अपने हाथ में लेकर अपने बुद्धि के अनुसार उसके शब्दों का अर्थ बताकर उन्होंने हमारा बुद्धि भ्रम किया इसलिए विश्व धर्म बनने की क्षमता रखने वाला हमारा धर्म हमारे लिए केवल रिलीजन हो गया धर्म का प्रतिशत तो रिलीजन नहीं है लेकिन उनके पास दूसरी उपमा नहीं थी उनके पास धर्म नहीं था धर्म के व्यापक संकल्प तो पहले पहले वो समझ नहीं सके और बाद में उनको उस संकल्प उस संकल्पना को छोटा करना था इसलिए उन्होंने उसका अर्थ विकृत कर दिया ये संस्कृत ट्रांसलेटेबल्स वाला जो किताब है उसमें इस विषय का बहुत अच्छा परामर्श लिया गया है बहुत मूल में बारीकी में जाकर हम लोगों को समझ में आए कि कहा कैसी गड़बड़ी हुई है और उसके आधार पर हम अपने आप को सुधार सके और बाकी जगत को बता सके कि हम क्या है वास्तविक हमारे शब्दों के अर्थ क्या है उनकी कल्पनाएं कितनी व्यापक कितनी भव्य है सारे विश्व के लिए कैसी कल्याणकारी है कि हम समझा सके ऐसी शक्ति इस पुस्तक के वाचन से अपने को मिलती है चौवन ऐसे शब्द उन्होंने सिलेक्ट किए उसके पहले इन शब्दों के अर्थों का संकुचितीकरण विकृतिकरण कैसा हुआ इसके बारे में कुछ कहा और इसलिए हम ये समझते हैं कि गड़बड़ी कहां हुई कैसे हुई और सही क्या है और हमारी क्षमता बनती है और इसलिए मुझे लगता है कि यह पुस्तक जब आएगा तब हमारे देश के लिए लिखने बोलने पढ़ने वाले विद्वानों ने भारतीय भाषाओं में लिखने वाले अंग्रेजी भाषाओं में लिखने वाले सब ने इसको पढ़ना चाहिए प्रमाणित अर्थ एक संत के द्वारा इसमें बताए गए हैं मूल में संकल्पनाएं हमारे देश के सब पंथ संप्रदायों के लिए समान होने के कारण कोई भी संत किसी भी पंथ संप्रदाय का बताता है तो भी मूल कल्पना नहीं बदलती वो हमारे ध्यान में आती है उसके आधार पर इन शब्दों के अधिकृत वास्तविक अर्थ हमको पता चलेंगे और जो हमारे मन का कॉलोनाइजेशन हुआ है और हम लोग अपने बारे में भ्रमित है और दुनिया के कई लोग हमारे बारे में भ्रम फैलाने में रथ है इन सब को हम ठीक कर सकेंगे ऐसी अपनी क्षमता बनेगी मुझे लगता है कि इस पुस्तक का बहुत व्यापक और भव्य स्वागत होना चाहिए धन्यवाद शासन चालक श्री मोहन भागवत जी यू हैव बीन इंस्पायरिंग पीपल टू वर्क टूवर्ड्स अ मोर कंपैशनेट काइंड एंड यूनिफाइड सोसाइटी एंड टू डीकोलोनाइज आवर माइंड्स एंड लैंग्वेज बट मे आई नाउ रिक्वेस्ट श्री सत्यनारायण दास बाबा जी द कोऑथर ऑफ दिस बुक टू से अ फ्यू वर्ड्स प्लीज Baba ji would you please share your thoughts with us Namaskar This is a great occasion and happy moment that this book is being released It is a book of labor of Sri Rajiv Malhotra ji and He involved me in this, and I'm happy to be part of this book. And as we heard from Swami Giriji, that when he was lecturing, he had difficulty in transmitting the knowledge in English language because he didn't know how to translate those words. Fact is that those words cannot be translated. We also heard from Dr. Bhatkar. 
very sad that our tendency is to understand even our own philosophy through english medium and that's a big mistake because that's actually the subject of this book that so many words cannot be translated in fact i would say that sanskrit has words all words even the letters cannot be translated like we have on the book the front cover we have a and then we have a now you may know that even this a cannot be written as a because a has got so many ways you know a is raswa dirgha pluta it is anuddatta swarita uddatta it is at the para pashanti madhyama vakri so many levels of the same a with anuswar without anuswar anunas nirvana nasik and so many ways this a can have that meaning in bhagavad gita krishna says akshara naam akaro asmi that this a i am now once you make it a in english that's not there that meaning is gone so we at least should understand our own sanskriti and our sanskriti is based on sanskrit language so it is very important and we heard also sri mohan bhagwat ji where he spoke about saint tukaram that the shabda and artha it is very important to know that because in uh, mahabhasya there is a statement that ekah shabda samyak gyata sushtu prayukta swarge loke kama dukha bhavati that even if one word you understand properly and you use it properly then it becomes beneficial not only here but also in the next that I, i i was an engineer before i studied from iit and i did not know about panini and kanad and gautam and patanjali none of these we didn't even hear these names which is a shame that in this country we don't even hear the name of our own great greatest scientists panini one of the greatest scientists this land has produced nobody can beat his system the way he has summarized sanskrit has unlimited number of words but he has summarized everything in 4000 sutras in such a beautiful manner it is amazing a book has been written with this idea that we try to understand the importance of our own sanskriti our own sanskrit language and i will ask the audience that please take time to read this book and it will help you in your life to understand so many things and to understand the value of your own sanskriti thank you thank you baba ji uh, i want people to know that my biggest accomplishment is my discovery of baba ji as the sanskrit exemplar second to none a uh, practitioner scholar also in the western tradition studying engineering and scholarship a perfect uh, collaborator partner for me so the idea was i just want to give people a little historical background to understand his importance uh, in the book being different published over a decade ago there's a huge chapter on sanskrit non translatables but it was always my dream to take it out make a big book out of it make a movement out of it and start with 108 words to sanskritize the english language so i approached baba ji and for the last 4 years we've been working on this as a video series we wanted to do 108 documentaries each on one one word 10 20 minute documentaries we decided later we do 54 and that's half and then we'll do the other half later so first came the series of 54 videos they are done they are edited and then in the process of editing them it was decided that uh, it will be nice to transcribe them edit the edit it into a book also so we'll have the uh, 54 videos the documentaries and we'll also have each of them in a book so the book will explain in details what the word is and the documentary will also add some more so this is how it, the book was born uh, after the documentaries the videos were done usually we write the book first and then we make videos but in this case it was originally a book a video project and then we got uh, a book out of it so it has been a delight i have learned so much and i'm very grateful to him i think that uh, he put so much time into it uh, he has his own team who worked on it uh, which which needs to be acknowledged and so here we are 
this has been a labor of love for him, me, and in the process, we've gone to know each other better. But even before this book, for a very long time, uh, he's helped me uh, learn so many things. Uh, so many of my previous books, I have acknowledged his contribution because he reviewed them, read them, and added so much more insight into me. So I, I hope people take this very seriously, this work, not as just a book, but as a movement. And in your own life, you got to start. See, if you were, if you learn one Sanskrit word a week and learn how to use it as part of your English vocabulary, then in one year, 52 weeks, you will have Sanskritized your language. And when you Sanskritize your language, then you can argue better, you can debate better, you can hold your own in conversations with other people, and then you can start Sanskritizing the rest of the society. Thank you very much. Let me thank uh, both of you, you know, both of our authors, Swamiji and Rajivji, for this undertaking. We need to reclaim our language, science, culture, and knowledge through Sanskrit, which can lead us towards a more fulfilling life. By now, it is clear that the book has the making of a movement. We have with us some luminaries, thought leaders, who would say a few words now. Let me first welcome Srimati Madhu Kishwarji to say a few kind words about the book. Madhu Kishwarji is an Indian academic and a commentator on contemporary issues. She is the founding editor of the critically acclaimed journal Manushi and is a pioneer scholar of women's studies in India. She has authored several books on gender and women's studies. She is currently the national professor in the Indian Council of Social Science Research. It's an honor to have her with us endorse the book. To all those who've joined for the release of Rajiv Malhotra's latest book, Sanskrit Non-Translatables. This book is another milestone in his decades long battle to help Hindus reclaim their heritage and save it from being further vandalized by the Christo Islamist and Kami onslaught. This book has been described as an audacious attempt at Sanskritizing the English language and enriching it with powerful Sanskrit words. Over the years, through his meticulous research, Rajiv has ably exposed the malicious designs of Western academia in trying to declare Sanskrit a dead language only for Hindus, while the Western world continues to parasite on it and digest all its treasures. In the process, they've bodlerized our sacred Dev Bhasha by offering highly distorted meanings of Sanskrit words and concepts which have profound culturally coded meanings. But the most important contribution of this book, as with all of Rajiv Malhotra's books, is to shake Hindus out of dhimmitude. It is a sign of our continuing intellectual slavery that we accepted the vulgarization of one of the most sacred parts of our civilizational heritage without protest. In turn, it has caused grievous damage to our society and polity. By picking up 54 such untranslatable terms from Sanskrit, Rajiv Malhotra's book is going to force Hindus to open their minds to their unique heritage and stop equating gold with garbage. But this is just the beginning of a long journey towards reclamation of our civilizational heritage. Rajiv reminds me of Guru Govind Singh's resolve in fighting a very unequal battle against Mughal tyranny with his war cry, Sava Lak Se Ek Ladao, meaning each one of my Dharma Rakshak soldier is capable of battling 1,25,000 enemy soldiers. Like Guru Govind Singh Ji, Rajiv is also fighting a battle against deeply entrenched enemies of India, both within and without. He's an intellectual Kshatriya par excellence and has single-handedly shaken up Western academia like none else. But Rajiv is not the kind to give up. He has produced a series of invaluable, well-researched books which show the path to the younger generation of scholars, something not available 
in the mainstream university curriculum. All these books are a product of intense intellectual tapasya and vigorous efforts to create a new paradigm for understanding India. If Rajiv wins, India wins. If Rajiv loses, India loses. That is why I consider it the kartavya of all Rashtravadi persons to lend support to Rajiv's epic battle against forces of adharma that have been dominating our education system. Thank you. Thank you, Srimati Madhukishwarji. Now may I request Dr. Kapil Kapoor, who is the chairperson of the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies and has a much respected authority on Sanskrit studies and linguistics. He has held important positions at various prestigious institutes, such as being the dean of the School of Languages, Literature and Culture at Jawaharlal Nehru University. He was also the pro vice chancellor of JNU. He has taught for more than 50 years. It's an honor to have him endorse the book. To talk about this wonderful book by Raji Malhotraji, Sanskrit Non Translatables. Uh, people may wonder that uh, why so much fuss about a few words? You see, since translation is such a universal activity, books are getting translated from one uh, language to another, one culture to another. And why such fuss? Well, because it says it has a history. You know, to subdue a country, to subdue uh, a country, to subdue a country, you you have to subvert its culture. And to subvert its culture, you have to demean or undermine its knowledge. You have to change the character of its knowledge. Because only that way you will make people lose, lose respect for their own thought, their own culture and their own civilization. Now, Hindu civilization is perhaps, the, not perhaps, in fact, it is the only civilization that has continued to be alive and kicking, continued to live in spite of all the, all the, all the history of disasters, invasions and all that. And so it has continued to live for almost 7,000 years. In fact, more than that, but we say 7,000 because we have the Sonoli excavations, we have the Marangar and so on. To subvert, to, to subdue a country, you subvert its culture. And since our country, our civilization, to our civilization, to is is a knowledge center civilization from day one. Gyan kendrit sabhyata hai. Gyan kendrit. Or is gyan kendrit sabhyata se. From this knowledge centered civilization, we have evolved a, a value, value oriented culture. Ek mulya adharit, you know, Sanskriti. And from this mulya value centered, value oriented culture, you know, which is founded in, in, the, in the vast knowledge heritage of our country, vast knowledge heritage of our country. We have developed a unity of consciousness in this country. Chaitanya ki ek atamta. Chaitanya ki ek atamta. People think alike. Wherever you go in this country, they think and they behave and they act alike. They share the shared value. It has all come because of the vast, massive knowledge heritage. Imagine Hindu civilization is from day one a knowledge center civilization. We have the world's first book, Rig Veda. We have the world's first poetry, first prose, first book of mathematics, first book of astronomy, first social sciences, first book of phonetics, first book of etymology, first book of meter, and you go on and on. We invented the numerals. We invented the decimal system. We work out the value of pi. We worked out the movement of the planets. We worked out the distance from the earth to the sun and all long back, long back, long before the, the West, the Western civilization or any other civilization had any other, any idea. Now this, this Macaulay got it right. You want to rule these people. You have to subvert their culture. You have to make them lose their respect for their culture. And how, how do you do that? You do that by demeaning its knowledge, by, by, Altering the character of its knowledge as it is understood by the people, as it is understood by the people. Because in, 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 in the Hindu civilization, knowledge is central. Knowledge is central. 
knowledge is the knowledge is the root of everything gyan marg is a supreme marg and because as as krishna i was almost saying lord but then malhotra ji would have objected because bhagwan is not lord and quite rightly he is a he is an avatar a manifestation and so krishna tells arjun knowledge is a great pure there is no purifier like knowledge knowledge purifies more than the fire more than the water more than the fire knowledge is purifier it's such a different metaphor from the contemporary metaphor of knowledge is power knowledge is purifier it purifies yourself and of course by purifying yourself it gives you control over your own self you don't like gain knowledge you don't become knowledgeable you aap gyan ka arjan isliye nahi karte that you have to rule others to exercise dominion over them to to accept as as in deuteronomy adam is adam is asked to you don't do that you you control yourself because yourself is your enemy yourself is your friend there is no other outside there is no other in the hindu civilization so this great knowledge tradition knowledge centered and knowledge is constituted in language knowledge is constituted in language as our great bhartri hari fifth century says ज्ञानम सर्वम शब्देन भाषते ज्ञानम सर्वम शब्देन भाषते ऑल नॉलेज इज कॉन्स्टिट्यूटेड इन लैंग्वेज ऑल नॉलेज इज कॉन्स्टिट्यूटेड इन लैंग्वेज एंड इन वर्ड्स इन वर्ड्स देर इज ही से देर इज नो थॉट देर इज नो कॉग्नेशन विच इज नॉट अकम्पनीड बाय वर्ड्स नॉट दैट यू कैन नॉट कैन नॉट एलिमिनेट द वर्ड्स इन योर इन योर मेडिटेशन which is the yoga philosophy but in a normal human concourse the normal human mind functioning now there is no cognition no cognition which is not accompanied by a word so knowledge is gyanam sarvam shabdena bhasate and this jagat this innumerable world that we see around us this jagat ye bhasha ka vikalp hai it is a construct of language it's a language you see language in the western civilization from the day moses went up and asked god to to write down his commandments and god wrote with the hand of fire language is representational in the west it represents a pre existing reality but language in india is constructivist it constructs the reality it constructs the reality for us so language that's why that's why gyana gyana is a gyan is that the center of our civilization and since gyan exists in language language is as important to us as the great scholar fitzstall said that language is central to the indian civilization just as geometry is central to the greek civilization so this whole knowledge existing in sanskrit so sanskrit is important in 1994 justice kuldeep singh ji justice kuldeep singh ji he uh, he delivered a judgment on sanskrit and he made a historic comment he said he said sanskrit is not only a language it is the vocabulary of our thought and culture and it is this vocabulary which has created which has created our the culture of our people in all indian languages have a, a sizable portion of their vocabulary is is tatsam tats tatsav tadva words of sanskrit we will not use the word borrow it is not a case of borrowing it's a case of one speech area breaking up into several speech areas and as uh, just as the phonological changes take place the words of that speech area they take local forms so language is the key language is the heart as uh, stall said that language is central to the indian mind just as geometry was central to the to the greek mind and in the rigveda in the 10th book in the hymn of dirg tamas there is a beautiful line gauri mimaye salilani takshati language cuts forms in the ocean of reality language cuts form the reality is an ocean it's an ocean you cannot cut form in geometry you are taught to segment to measure to dissect and then put together that is the greek view of terra firma as a reality but for us 
Terra cognita is the reality, not terra firma. And the forms we construct, we construct through language, through language, through words. We name, to name is to know. We name and we know. We name and we know. So language is central. Now is Sanskrit language, which was a medium, which is a medium of our intellectual heritage. It is there. Macaulay got it right. You subvert the culture. How do you do that? You change the akar, gyan ka swarupa badal diye. Change the character of knowledge. How do you do that? You change the language. Or you change the language that is one. So he said, we'll not teach them in their languages. And the second, and the second method is that you render the text. You render the text from this language, Sanskrit, into other languages, either in such a way that the concept changes. And the concept begins to look either illogical or foolish or repetitive or tautological. One of these are things are all counted in our tradition. People by translating words like Adi Shankara, he said, Jagat Brahma Satya Jagat Mithya. Brahma, Brahma Satya and Mithya has been translated as illusion, unreal or false. And that has changed the attitude of the educated Indians to Adi Shankaracharya. But mind you, for Hindus, the world is not unreal. The world is not unreal at all. The world is very real. There is a real world out there. But when I predicate about it, when I predicate about it, predicate about it, I construct the world. Every individual constructs his world. Jagat bhasha ka vikalp hai. Mithya simply means, Mithya is from the Proto-Indo-European root. Proto-Indo-European root. Mithna, which means to construct. My mother used to say when I was disturbed, Padaya tu ki Mithya what have you constructed? What have you constructed? And uh, uh, in the same way when Shankar says, Jagat Mithya, this world is a construct, what we enumerate. No two human beings not occupying the same space naturally have the same perspective. The world is different for each one of us. And there are two worlds. One is the real world which is out there. The other is the world we predicate. And that is what Shankaracharya meant when he was talking of. Therefore, sir, Raji Malhotra ji, hats off to you. Thanks to you, you have picked on the crux, the words, the concepts. You want the concepts to, Indian concepts, to retain their swarupa. Swarupa. And how can they retain their swarupa? They cannot be put in other language, in another language. Because when you put it in the other language, there can be either mischief or motivation or simply ignorance. And the result will be those who read those granthas in translation, they will lose respect for those texts. They will lose respect for idea. They will lose respect for their culture. And they will lose respect for their civilization as educated Indians these days have done. They have lost self-respect. They have lost respect for their own culture and tradition. We are all disaffiliated people. I hope, sir. Your book will be on the table of every educated Indian, educated in courts, and you will help the people to reaffiliate themselves with their own self. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kapil Kapoorji. Rest assured, we will reclaim our achievements with the tools the book offers. I now request Dr. Subramanian Swami to say a few words. Dr. Swami has been an economist par excellence and currently serves as a nominated member of the parliament in the Rajya Sabha. He has written and spoken extens extensively on economics, foreign affairs. He was a professor of mathematical economics at the IIT Delhi and was a former associate professor at the Department of Economics at the Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Yeah, today to uh, through the electronic media, address you on a very important development that is taking place in the uh, cultural renaissance of India, which was, uh, which was really intellectually articulated and introduced and spread by uh, Raji Malhotra through his variety of books, starting with Breaking India 
and he's written numerous books on a variety of dimensions of the cultural renaissance that we are all aiming at. And uh, the, the development of a modern Indian mindset rooted in the past, but ready to innovate for the future. That's the goal uh, of, in, of man making that uh, Rajiv Malhotra at the core has been addressing. Now with uh, Satya Narayan and Dasab Babaji, he has uh, formulated a new concept called Sanskrit non-translation translatables. <laughs> and uh, that is uh, a new way of Sanskritizing English. Now English is now more a British language. It's an international language. It's spoken in uh, Japan. It's spoken in South Korea, in China, in the Middle, uh, in the Middle East. It's uh, become an a, a international language and the English have lost, uh, shall I say, uh, control of it. And so the world is now seeing a lot of new phrases and so on coming. And uh, the best example is when, when you speak to an American, you see words which you will not see an Englishman uttering, but it's part of English. So in that uh, uh, context, uh, he, um, uh, Rajiv Malhotra and his colleague, uh, Babaji, they are advocating what they call as loaning Sanskrit words to English without a translation. Now, is this possible? Well, if you look at a mother teaching language to a child, is there any translation? She it's just, just by example, by uh, uh, by physical uh, um, you know, uh, uh, presentation. For instance, uh, um, uh, she will take a, a, a pot and uh, tell her child, Patra. And so the, the the child will only know patra. It will not know vessel, nothing, nothing of the of any other. So that becomes a part of your language, and it becomes assimilated uh, in, in your uh, mental process. Now uh, today, Sanskrit words are there in every Indian language. Some more some less. And uh, what uh, Rajiv Malhotra correctly says is many of the Sanskrit words already in English, they have a different, uh, I mean, a limited meaning or a different meaning. Pandit. Pandit is, uh, is a multivarious uh, concept. Similarly, Om. What is, how do you uh, explain Om? Uh, ahimsa. Ahimsa is not uh, pacifism, pacifism. It is preference in circumstances. And Krishna has demonstrated in Mahabharata, which is one of the most violent wars we have had in our histories, that ahimsa did not mean nonviolence in the sense of it, absoluteness, which perhaps, in my opinion, Gandhi mis misread it, or people misread Gandhi, because Gandhi did support uh, India sending troops to Kashmir. So therefore, uh, these words acquire a false meaning when you uh, bring it in through translation. And today, most of the English and Sanskrit teachers who are purists, they do not uh, give translations at all. If they take a pair, pick up uh, uh, an uh, apple, they will say, what is the Sanskrit word for apple? They will not say like that. They say, what is this? So this is what is mean by uh, a transmission and by uh, communication, learning by communication. And that is why today uh, we are finding a situation where Sanskrit words are to be introduced uh, in, in uh, that is what Sanskrit words. They cannot um, uh, or, you know, uh, abrogate that word in their language. And even our constitution, Article 3, 340, says that uh, Hindi should use Sanskrit words. And Devanagari should be the script. So Devanagari is the script of Marathi, it's a script of Nepali, and so on. So you have today 
a basically a sanskritization process which um, um, uh, Raj, Rajiv Malhotra and his colleague want to accelerate. Uh, I would also point out to you that there are uh, now schools of thought which make you learn Sanskrit by memorization without knowing the meaning because the mere repetition of those words uh, make a lot of difference. For example, St. James School in London, which is in three, three branches, they have made uh, Sanskrit as a second compulsory language. And every morning they recite, make the students recite Sanskrit shlokas without the, many of them even knowing the meaning at the early stage. Later on, as they learn Sanskrit, they begin to understand it. But because repetition of these words or um, uh, you know, uh, sing it in the form of a prayer in the morning develops the brain faster than any other language. And that is why in, a, in an elite school like St. James School, uh, the principal has decided, the board, the board has agreed uh, to make Sanskrit as a second language and make them recite Sanskrit shloka. They don't talk about secularism and so on. So in this context, what we are having today is uh, a, a situation where uh, Sanskrit may become an international language. It's already now accepted as an international language for the sole international language for uh, artificial intelligence. But over the period of time, as others also start accumulating because of the pressure of knowing about the advanced technologies, you will find that Sanskrit uh, will be Sanskritizing all the religions. So it's a very revolutionary idea of. Uh, of Rajiv Malhotra and his colleague uh, Babaji. And I think uh, this needs to be publicized, supported, and propagated uh, by all those who learn from the lecture that uh, Rajiv Malhotra and his colleagues are going to give you. And therefore, uh, I am uh, very honored and pleased that I'm here today to give you a brief introduction to this topic. And I hope to learn from it in the future when the book comes out. I shall certainly give it priority attention to read it and assimilate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swami. It is our absolute pleasure to have you. May I now request Babaji to say a few words? Please share his thoughts, maybe? Yes, uh, it's a great pleasure to hear Dr. Swami because Dr. Swami was my professor at IIT Delhi. Of course, there he was professor of economics, and now he is speaking on this book. And he made a very valid point, taking out the idea from the book that we are saying that these words can be loaned. There is no need of that, but they can be understood like a mother is teaching to the child. So in Sanskrit, actually, we have a word for that. That is called Vridha Vyavahara. There are different ways we, we learn. We learn from Vyakarnam, we learn from dictionary, the meaning of the words. We also learn the meaning just by seeing how other people are making use of that word. So this is a very valid means, which is listed with the Vyavahartasya. So that's what he was referring to. And it should be utilized. Once people start using, then that's how we understand words. And But if we use them in a wrong sense, or if we translate it, that's also the way we misunderstand them. So he made a very nice point about that, and I thank him for that. Ji Babaji, and thank you to you and Rajiv Ji for coming up with the book. It, it offers absolutely practical tips, which we will discuss later. May I now request Padma Shri, Dr. Shubhash Kak, to share, this, uh, to share his thoughts on the book. He is the Regents Professor, Computer Science Department at Oklahoma State University an honorary visiting professor of engineering at Jawaharlal Nehru University and a member of the Indian Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory Council. He has published extensively on the history and philosophy of science, archaeoastronomy and ancient astronomy. It's an honor to have him endorse the book. Sanskrit uh, non-translatables by Rajiv Manhotra and Satyanarayan Das Babaji is a very important book for a variety of reasons. 
First of all, um, it's very lucid introduction to uh, Hinduism and, and to some of the key concepts which constitute uh, the Hindu way of looking at reality. They're not quite the same as uh, European uh, concepts. And uh, for many reasons, the words that have been used out of uh, the European or Western experience to represent these words do injustice uh, to the Indian experience. And therefore, uh, the book is very timely. The other element uh, related to the importance of this book is that of all the um, uh, nations in the world, India's has become a big fight between uh, the old uh, colonialists and their uh, successors and uh, the indigenous or natives who are a part of that uh, tradition uh, about who shall interpret uh, the past. Uh, the Europeans and the Westerners uh, a couple of hundred years ago took upon themselves uh, the task and arrogated to themselves the task of interpreting India. And they're not uh, ready to let go. And therefore, there have been a, a lot of uh, attempts in recent past, which have been um, described uh, very well in many books about how the basis of uh, this control was partly Europe's desire to have its own uh, ancient past, which it did not uh, have. And since the Indian and the European languages belong to the same family, somehow this ridiculous and bizarre idea that uh, the Vedas, which are the ancient, the most ancient part of uh, the Indian tradition, somehow were brought into India by uh, Europeans, uh, which uh, are euphemistically called Indo uh, Europeans. And uh, after they came to India, it's been downhill ever since, but all that is great about India is truly a part of uh, uh, the European experience. Now, one may laugh at it, but sadly, um, uh, acad academic halls are not uh, necessarily the places where people look at all of these questions most dispassionately, and something uh, needs to be done for um, the people belonging to the tradition to, um, to fight back. And uh, uh, Raji Malhotra has been a part of this fight, and this is his uh, second book. I do hope that uh, people will read it, and uh, it will uh, go to uh, change uh, notions which have long been outdated and uh, put the whole subject on a surer footing so that uh, India and the West can meet on equal terms and appreciate each other. Thank you, Dr. Subhash Kak. We now have Padmashri Chamukrishna Shastriji, who is the co-founder of Sanskrita Bharati. He has been working tirelessly for the cause of the Sanskrit language since decades. An author of 13 books in the Sanskrit language, he also has an extensive experience in education and teaching methods. May we now request Shastriji to say a few words. Aham Srimataha Rajiv Mallotra Mahodeyasya Ahardam Abhinandanam Karomi Yataha Shri Rajiv Mallotra Mahodeyaha Ashakyanuadanam, Sanskrita Shabdanam, Sanskrit non translatables iti Pustakasya Prakashanam Kurvanasti, Tasya Idanim, Lokarpanam Bhavati, Sanskrita Kshetre Etat Kinchana, Adbutam Kariamasti, Yuganukulam Avashakam Kariam Asti, Sri Rajiv Malotra Mahodayam Aham. Vimshatyadika Varshe Bhyaha Janami Tasya Pustakani Being Different Battle for Samskrut Indras Net Ityadini Samskrta Kshetrasya Atyantam Upakarakani Pustakani Vastutaha Samskrta Vangmayasya Vivida Granthanam Vishaye 
यत् पश्चिम देशेशु शोध कार्य संदर्भे यत् असमीचिनम कार्यम जातम अर्थात विकृता अनुवादा अन्यथा अनुवादा अपार्थी कृता अनुवादा इत्यादि नाम कारणतः क्वचित अर्थहीन अनुवादा अभवन्न एतेशाम कारणे न वस्तुतः समुस्कृत वांगमयस्थ विषयानाम अन्यथा प्रचारह जातह अस्ति भारतस्य एव कुचित्रम निर्मितम अस्ति अतः वस्तुतः तत्संदर्भे श्रीमता राजीव मल्लोत्र महोदयेन गतेशु विंशत्यधिक वर्षेशु यत्यत कार्यम कृतम अस्ति तत् समुस्कृत लोकस्य भारतस्य च अत्यंतम उपकारकम कार्यम अस्ति इदानीम यत संस्कृत नॉन ट्रांसलेटेबल सीटी अनुवाद्य शब्दानाम संस्कृत शब्दानाम अशक्यानुवादानाम संस्कृत शब्दानाम संग्रहम कृत्वा पुस्तक रूपेण इदानीम यत प्रकाशय नस्ति एतत पुस्तकम अत्यंतम उपकारकम पुस्तकम सर्वैहि संस्कृत छात्रैहि संस्कृत संशोधकैहि शोध छात्रैहि संस्कृत शिक्षकैहि संस्कृत अध्यापकैहि प्राध्यापकैहि संस्कृत पंडितैहि सर्वैहि अपि अर्थात प्रत्येकम संस्कृत ज्ञेन एतत पुस्तकम पठनीयम अस्ति वस्तुतः राजीव मल्लोत्रा महोदयस्य सर्वाणि अपि पुस्तकानि संस्कृत विश्वविद्यालयेषु संस्कृत महाविद्यालयेषु शास्त्री आचार्य बीए एमए इत्यादि कक्षासु पाठ्यपुस्तक रूपेण स्थापनीयानि सन्ति तदर्थम अत्यंतम योग्यानि यावत पर्यन्तम संस्कृत छात्राः संस्कृत अध्यापकाः संस्कृत प्राध्यापकाः राजीव मल्लोत्र महोदयस्य एतानि पुस्तकानि न पठन्ति विशेषतया संस्कृत नॉन ट्रान्सलेटेबल्स पुस्तकम एतत यावत न पठन्ति तावत संस्कृत ज्ञानम तत्र संस्कृत वाङ्मय विषये यह पूर्व पक्षः अस्ति तस्य पूर्व पक्षस्य एव अवगमनम एव न भवेत अतः अहम सर्वान संस्कृत ज्ञान निवेदयामि एतत पुस्तकम अवश्यम क्रीणन्तु पठन्तु अपि च एतस्य प्रचारम कुर्वन्तु इति राजीव मल्लोत्र महोदयस्य इन्फिनिटी फाउंडेशन माध्यमेन यत्यत कार्यम प्रचलति तत् सर्वम अपि अस्माभि सर्वैः अपि अनुसर्तव्यम अस्ति विशेषतया एतस्मिन् पुस्तके संस्कृत नॉन ट्रान्सलेटेबल सीति पुस्तके श्री नारायणदास बाबा महोदयः राजीव मल्लो श्री राजीव मल्लोत्र महोदयेन सह मिलित्वा यत् पुस्तकम रचितवान एतद् अत्यंतम प्रशंसार्हम अस्ति पुनश्च पुस्तके तयोः द्वयोः अपि यः उपोद्गातः अस्ति तथैव श्री नित्यानंद मिश्र महोदयस्य अपि यः उपोद्गातः अस्ति सः अपि सर्वैः अपि पठनीयः अस्ति एवं सर्वे न केवलम एतावत पुस्तकं पठनीयम अपि तु इतः परं सर्वैः अपि यदा संस्कृत कृतीनां विषये संस्कृत वाङ्मयस्थ विषयानां विषये संस्कृते यत् यानि दर्शनानि सन्ति तेषां दर्शनानां अथवा कृतीनां विषये अथवा अनुवाद संदर्भे आंग्लभाषायां लेखनसमये अननुवाद्य शब्दानां अनुवाद अनर्ह शब्द संस्कृत शब्दानां यथा अवत प्रयोग करणीयः यथा पुण्यम इति अस्ति आत्मा इति अस्ति जीवः इति अस्ति परमात्मा इति अस्ति भगवान इति अस्ति देवः इति अस्ति एतेषां सर्वेषां पदानां अनुवादः निश्चयेन मूलार्थं न प्रतिपादयन्ति विकृतार्थं अन्यार्थं अपार्थं प्रतिपादयन्ति यदि अन्यभाषया अनुवादः क्रियते चेत अतः अस्माभिः इतः परं आंग्लभाषायां लेखनसमये एतादृश अनुवाद अनर्ह शब्दानां यथावत संस्कृत पदानां एव आंग्लभाषायां प्रयोग करणीयः एतत् किञ्चन महत् मूवमेंट भवेत् आन्दोलनं भवेत् एवं 
आंदोलन रूपेण संस्कृत वयम् एतत् कार्यम् स्वीकुर्म चेत सर्वे संस्कृत विश्वविद्यालय अभी एक कार्यम स्वीकुर्वती चेत तर्हि एव अग्रिम दश विंशति वर्षेशु संपूर्ण बौद्धिक जगति वैश विश्व एव किंचन नूतन बौद्धिक तत्र स्थाप विचार स्थापनम भवेत तादृशम कार्यम अस्मा भी सर्वे ही करणीयम श्री राजीव एतस्मिन कार्ये श्री राजीव मल्लोत्र महोदयेन सह अस्मा भी संस्कृत ज्ञेयि सर्वे ही मिलित्वा कार्यम करणीयम इति उक्त्वा पुनरपि श्री राजीव मल्लोत्र महोदयस्य अभिनंदनम कृत्वा मम वचनात विरामा धन्यवाद शास्त्री जी Sri Chamukrishna Sastriji has spoken so nicely in Sanskrit about Sanskrit, which is a great pleasure. And he made a wonderful point that all the students of Sanskrit, the teachers, the principals, the head of the departments, they must read this book. It is my personal experience that those people who are in the field of Sanskrit, many of them, they feel inferior to those who speak in English. In fact, they think that if someone is speaking in English, that person is an educated person and they themselves don't think that they are educated. So they have sort of inferiority complex, but they should know that the wealth of knowledge which is available in Sanskrit is not found in any other language and they are the one who are studying it. So they should feel confident about their own subject and their own knowledge, not feel inferior. And that is also one of the purpose of this book. So I thank Shastriji for bringing out this point. Thank you, Babaji. We will now have Sri Nikunj Trivedi ji discuss the book briefly. He is the chairman of Hindu Students Council, which is North America's largest pan-Hindu pan youth organization. He has been a youth leader for causes including Hindu heritage and culture while raising awareness of issues affecting Hindus. It's a pleasure to hear him speak about the book from the perspective of the young and the bright. Okay. My name is Nikul Srivedi and I'm the president of the Coalition of Hindus of North America. I want to take this moment to congratulate Rajivji for this wonderful initiative that he has embarked upon and for this trailblazing and path-breaking book on Sanskrit non-translatables. I cannot emphasize how important this work is in terms of setting the narrative about Sanskrit, about our culture, about our tradition. By these 54 words, we can have a deep and profound impact on the way people talk about Hindu dharma, people talk about our culture, people talk about our heritage in our own words, rather than using another language, which then loses the depth of our philosophy and culture. For example, as I was growing up, I had often seen translations of Atman being translated into soul. I had seen Bhakti translated into prayer or devotion, Puja being translated into prayer, um, Ahimsa being translated into nonviolence. So many different words that when you take the original Sanskrit meaning have so much more to offer. So through this work, I'm excited to see that a new way of thinking and a new way of dialogue around our philosophy and our heritage is going to be introduced. And we will get a chance to then introduce these words into the English vocabulary by what he calls Sanskritization of English. So this way, English being a flexible language can adopt these words in its original uh, context and meaning without losing the beauty of them. And that's extremely important for what we are trying to do. When we work on advocacy work, when we work with the youth, uh, they often question, what does this mean? How does it relate to something that's daily and important and that's relevant in their lives? Uh, so through these words, just these 54 words, we can really give them a glimpse of the entire treasure trove that is Hindu dharma. So once again, I think uh, as far as supporting this work, as far as working with Rajiv, uh, we're really excited about that. I think this is a this is an important moment, especially when Diwali is coming up, to give the book of Sanskrit non-translatables 
as a gift to all our friends and family members, our relatives, anyone who's really interested in Sanskrit. Um, calling the light of Sanskrit is extremely important. So let's this Diwali, let's give the light of Sanskrit through these 54 uh, non-translatables, Rajiv Ji's book, and let's make this a truly global movement that can really change the game. Just like how Breaking India changed the way people started interacting about the way Hindu dharma, the way India is being portrayed. Uh, similarly, being different changed the way we uh, talk about uh, the, the to defend our culture from a uh, intellectual Kshatriya manner. Let's take this particular book and let's make that a game-changing narrative for us. So once again, I want to congratulate Rajivji for embarking on this uh, mission and we are with you. Uh, we're here to support it in every single way possible. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Trivedi ji. We are also super excited to enrich the English language with Sanskrit words too. Now we have Sri Arnav Kejriwal ji, who is the president of the Hindu Students Council and a graduate of Washington University in St. Louis. He has presented at, the, at several WAVES conferences. He speaks about the book from the perspective of the youth again. Namaste and thank you, Rajiv ji. Satya Narayan Das Babaji, and to all of the hosts of this event for having me as part of your panel for the book launch of the Sanskrit non translatables project. As the president of Hindu Students Council and as a lifetime student of Rajiv Ji's work, I personally know the impact that Rajiv Ji has had on college campuses and for youth across North America, whether it's addressing Hindu phobia on campus or being able to help students precisely and confidently explain our Hindu framework without a lot of the misconceptions that come from the Western ecosystem of learning. And then also being able to combat the constant cultural appropriation that students are seeing of our beautiful tradition, whether it's festivals on campus, no longer being called Hindu, but rather Indian or South Asian. And then also the concepts like yoga and meditation, which have beautiful meaning and richness of value in Hindu Dharma, getting reduced to physical exercises on campus where students have no idea of the connection that those actually have to the Hindu history. The Non-Translatables Project is going to take, take our conversations on campus to another level because now for the first time students are going to have scholarly work behind the richness of our tradition that helps them explain concepts in Hindu Dharma without having to rely on the Western lexicon. For the first time we'll be able to use a Hindu framework in describing our own concepts and no longer having to map ourselves to Christianity or other religions from the West. As the president of Hindu Students Council, I serve as a leader for one of the largest youth organizations across North America. We have over 40 chapters across colleges and high schools, and we serve a lot of the major institutions, educational institutions across the US and Canada. One of our biggest focuses in Hindu Students Council has always been on advocacy and awareness. We wanna help students empower, we wanna empower students and help them when it comes to being able to address Hindu phobia on campus, whether that's in media, pop culture, or even from their professors, as Rajiv Ji has aptly noted many times in his career, being able to help explain and showcase the richness of our Hindu Dharma beyond the phrases that their peers might know. Our tradition. But yet the challenge is that these students have to do that so far using English words. Thousands of years of our history and our heritage get reduced to simple words that we can't even describe properly when we try to map them to what our Western peers know. So I personally know of one example that Rajiv Ji helped me with. The term Atman has great meaning in, in the his, in Hindu lexicon. Atman is the essence which each of us has that is of the same Brahman, but yet has no qualities of its own, right? Those qualities like color, smell, gender, race, don't exist in Atman. Yet many times we see students trying to map Atman to soul, which is a really unfair comparison because the Western idea of soul is one that does mimic the person whose body it inhibits. And once that person moves on to the afterlife, that soul still retains those same qualities. So during 2012 at the World Association of Vedic Studies, Rajivji, guided us through a paper that we wrote on the difference between the Atman and the soul. 
And it's terms like these that have profound impacts on students, because if you think about kind of the current college landscape, the idea of social media and Black Lives Matter and a lot of these social justice campaigns that happen on campus, the, the Hindu concept of Atman has significant teachings that it can give to students when it comes to understanding equality and the idea that the skin color that I have here does not actually represent my true Atman. Those are valuable concepts that get lost when we try to translate terms like Atman to soul. And so it's very heartening for me personally, knowing that Rajiv Ji has been working on this for almost a decade and guiding students like me to write papers on this, that now he's formalizing this work in a proper non-translatables initiative. And I know students across the country are suddenly going to have their eyes open when it comes to understanding the richness of certain words, dharma, moksha, no longer limiting those to one sentence or one word catchphrases from the English dictionary, but really being able to spend hours diving into each word and the, the context with which that word is mentioned in Hindu Dharma. So as part of the book release, you know, I get the privilege of getting a chance to look at the table of contents and I'm extremely excited to kind of see the foreword and the, the table of contents for the terms that are gonna be addressed in this book. And I know for instance, one that many students across the country might look at is the idea that Loka is not planet. That's the name of one of the chapters. And you know, a couple months ago, Lady Gaga ended up tweeting um, and it got sent over the Twitterverse she tweeted, Loka Samastha Sukhi no Bhavantu, a famous Sanskrit verse. Yet, you know, the first tweet under that is the idea that everyone on the planet is the same. And, you know, I don't yet know the true Sanskrit translation that Rajiv Ji has in mind for Loka, but I'm extremely excited to see it because even though it's nice to see our Hindu words and Sanskrit words make it into Western social media, Without the true meaning, that, that value and that pride gets diluted. We're not really offering anything unique to the world. And all that we're doing is showing, hey, we have something similar to what Western belief has, right? It's only when we break free of that tie and truly believe in mutual respect rather than equality, like Rajiv Ji says, right? Mutual respect can only be earned when we showcase our difference and have pride in the fact that we have a different meaning than you and that's okay, but we believe that there's richness in our meaning. So as part of this book release, I'm very excited to have Rajiv Ji and Satya Narayan Das Baba Ji join HSC for book tours and visit campuses, whether it's virtually or in person once COVID lifts. Being able to explain and you know having presentations on each of these beautiful terms that they're describing in their book. And I know, you know with 40 or 50 different keywords that they're looking in on, each of those can be its own presentation or classroom or seminar for students. So I'm very excited that for the potential that this book brings and really instilling pride in Hindu Dharma on campus. And I give my heartiest congratulations to Rajiv Ji and Satya Narayan and Das Baba Ji on, on this book release. And, you know, we're all rooting for you and, you know, thank you again and namaste for having me. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers, all the panelists. I think we had uh, seven of them uh, after the first three VIPs who launched the book. Uh, each of them expressing in their own way what they think of the book, why it's important, uh, and, and how they will make an effort from their own side to propagate this, uh, not just book, but a movement. I think this could be a tipping point because, you know, it's very important to have interventions which have a huge leverage. So a huge leverage means that there's a trend in one direction and somebody stops in front of the tank, like... I don't know how many of you remember uh, when there was this uh, Tiananmen Square uh, massacre when the students were protesting in, in Beijing in the famous Tiananmen Square. I visited that Tiananmen Square on the anniversary of that event uh, a few years later. But that event uh, made uh, world history because students were in the tens of thousands and the Chinese army, the, the Communist Party ordered tanks. So a huge row of tanks was going and there was one student, one student, he alone had his jacket over his shoulder and this tank line of tanks was coming to finish off these people. And he stood there and he hit this. He stopped the, uh, the, the leading tank and the tank was going this way, that way. And this student was also going like that, delaying the whole tank army uh, by enough minutes so that these people could run for safety. Otherwise, they were all going to be finished. 
Now, that's a tipping point that the world took notice of this. CNN made history by getting this picture. Time magazine put it on the cover. This became like the picture of the year. And it put a lot of pressure on China. I mean, they never fixed their problem, but it really spotlighted the whole human rights and started this whole movement of, uh, you know, criticizing China on human rights uh, violations and so on. So there are certain events when either you stop something, it takes a lot of courage, or you start something, or you change the direction of something, and it will take a long time to have its effect. It's not like, okay, you didn't do this job in one month, three months, five years. This will take a very long time. I believe that a movement to not translate certain Sanskrit words and make them part of our English vocabulary or French vocabulary or Chinese vocabulary or any kind of language vocabulary and Sanskritize the vocabulary that we are using, this movement, this is a tipping point. It will take a whole generation to make an impact. But rather than accelerating the further digestion of our categories into English, and rather than you know letting Sanskrit become atrophied into a kind of a museum, we are going to start resistance, and we are going to train more and more people to uh, do this Sanskritization of English and stop this business of uh, uh, digestion, stop this business of our words being considered same as some, some English words. And this movement is something each of you can join. Each of you can be, say, okay, I'm going to Sanskritize my vocabulary. I'm going to make it a topic of conversation with my friends, with my family. I'll pick one word and that's all I will discuss in a given situation. One word is all you need. And then you'll have the courage to learn one more word and one more word. So I want to thank all the speakers. I want to thank Babaji. I want to thank all the people who are who helped us. We have a, an amazing team of people on our side. Uh, we have uh, Manogna, we've had uh, Sudarshan, we've had Anurag, we've had so many people uh, in our team. Uh, and of course, uh, Amaryllis and Babaji's had uh, Jessica and various people on his team. Uh, too many people to uh, name, uh, in fact. Uh, and I want to thank all of them because they are part of this movement. And so are you, the viewer. You can be part of this movement. Make this your Swadharma. Make this your Yagna. Make this your Tapasya, that you are part of this movement to Sanskritize the English language. Namaste. True, Rajiv Ji. You rightly said that we would need to sustain the efforts to make the movement impactful. But let me also thank Arnavji and Nikunji for their support. For a more nuanced discussion, may I now invite Tuhin Sinha, the best-selling author and politician, for a, a question and answer session with our authors Rajivji and Babaji. Tuhi, Tuhin is acknowledged among the most prolific Indian writers with a maverick knack for experimenting. He is a national media panelist for BJP. He's a thought leader. And until September to, uh, this year, he was a spokesperson. May I please request you to take over the virtual stage for a Q&A session with Rajiv Ji and Baba Ji. This is the session we have all been waiting for with better breath. Namaskar, and thank you for having me here. As an author, I can tell you that there are some books which carry a very positive feel. And uh, Sanskrit non-translatables is one of them. You know, the positive feel probably comes from the name, the colors, a uh, rich shade of yellow and saffron. And this positive feel also has a dharmic, uh, you know, mission to it, as we all uh, witnessed during the introduction of the book by various luminaries. Now, Sanskrit, we all know, is the sacred language of Hinduism, the language of classical Hindu philosophy and of historical texts of Hinduism and Buddhism. But unfortunately, over the last few hundred years, we have seen the erosion of uh, the language in various forms. And what is particularly saddening is that this erosion continued in the last 70 years past independence. So if you ask me, this book was, you know, waiting to be written uh, because a movement was waiting to begin. And I'm glad that um, I'm, I'm glad that uh, in the last 25 years through Infinity Foundation, Rajiv Ji helped initiated the movement. Now, what, without taking much time, I would like to get into the question answer session. Now, as we all know, this was a book waiting to be written, considering the indifference of contemporary young Indian towards a civilizational identity. 
Babaji, uh, let me begin with you, Babaji. Just how crucial would you say Sanskrit is to our Sanskriti? Well, to Hindi, how crucial means that there is no Sanskrit without Sanskrit. Because our Sanskrit is not what people think of culture. And these days, I know in India, whenever there's a cultural program, they think of some kind of music, dance. They think that is culture. No, that may be culture, but that's not Sanskrit. Our Sanskrit is rooted in Shastra. And Shastras are written in Sanskrit language. So if you want to understand our Sanskrit, which unfortunately we are not understanding at present, and we have gone very far away, most of us, because of our modern education system in which practically not much is being taught about Sanskrit or Sanskriti. And we are seeing the outcome of that. So Sanskriti, Sanskrit, Samskar, they all come from the same root word three with a some suffix which is applied in the sense of improve, improvement, purification, making something better, which means either you add something good which is missing in a person, of course here we are talking about person, it could be an object also, or to remove the impurities which are existing in that person. So it works in two ways, that it removes the wrong behavior, bad side, the, you know, adharmic thinking of a person, and other is to add the good to it. So like you, for example, you eat food, everybody eats, but we know that certain things are not good for my body. They can make me sick. Not that everything which we can eat is edible or healthy for me. So then there is a rule, you know, there is a description that this, this thing is good for you and this thing is not good for you. So that's what Sanskriti teaches us. We, have, we as human beings, we have energy to act, we have energy to think, we have energy to convey our ideas. We can perform action in three ways, with our body, with our speech and with our mind. So if this is not sanskritized, if it is not purified, then what will happen that I'm going to do it in an asanskrit way. Asanskrita kriya hina tamsa rajasa vrita. A person who is asanskrita, he is a kriya hina. Kriya hina here does not mean that he doesn't perform any action. Means he would not perform action which is beneficial for oneself as well as for the society. So everybody is acting. But they are acting more in a selfish manner, primarily for what they think as themselves, you know, that I'm this physical body and their area or the field of action is limited to their family most of the time. But Sanskrit teaches you that you are beyond this body, you are beyond the mind. And at that level, we have similarities. And then we would not discriminate, we will not try to exploit somebody else, the law principle of law of karma comes into play. So these are the things which we understand. If we understand Sanskrit and we understand Sanskrit properly. And when we don't understand, these days people don't even understand the law of karma. That does not mean that it is not active. Just like if you don't believe in the principle of gravitational force, that does not mean that it is not acting on you. Wherever you go, gravity is acting on you, whether you believe in it or you don't believe in it. In the same way, you believe in karma or you don't believe in it. It works. It is acting. It is a law. It is a principle. It's a universal principle. It's a principle of this whole cosmos. So if we don't understand that, then we have these problems like what is happening now, COVID-19 or global, global warming or pollution. You know, everything is polluted. Why pollution is coming? That is Asanskrita. Rajasa Tamasabrita. Then you become covered by Tamas and Rajas. And then obviously your actions will be in Rajas and Tamas. And that's those type of actions will bring result which will ultimately bring you trouble. Rajasastu Falam Dukkham. Agyanam Tamsaha Falam. 
so action performed in rajas will lead you to dukha ultimately maybe immediately you feel happy and you feel some satisfaction some pleasure you know momentary pleasure but the outcome will be suffering and tamas will lead you to agyan to ignorance which will also lead to suffering ultimately so that's why it is very important to study sanskrit and then understand sanskrit because sanskrit is for your benefit it is for the benefit of the individual as well as for the society this sanskrit our bharatiya sanskrit is the sanskrit which is for the whole planet this sanskrit the sage is the rishis when they gave it they did not give it for india the subcontinent they gave it for human beings vedas vedanta vedangas smritis itihasas puranas they are for everyone and none of these things existed when they were given to us all these things came later on so there was no there is no question that they are going to discriminate against this dharma that dharma or so called religion no these things did not exist at that time so therefore it is very crucial and everybody at least we indians who are born here in bharat bhumi we have such a great fortune that there are still people here there are still gurus there are teachers as we saw you know dr chamukrishna shastri is working so hard for sanskrit so we still have and we should take advantage of this otherwise what is the point in taking birth in india you can be born anywhere else so we have all the knowledge in this scriptures and we should take advantage of that and that is our fortune and that is the importance of sanskrit for sanskriti because this sanskriti is not independent of dharma sanskrit is also not independent of dharma we should know that in in uh, bhartri hari in his vakya padiyam he says upasniyam yatnena shastram vyakaranam mahat he calls even this vyakaranam sanskrit vyakaranam obviously not any other vyakaranam he is saying about sanskrit he says it is mahat shastra it is a great shastra it is called anushasanam atha shabdanushasanam that's what patanjali writes it is a discipline so it is not just some grammar or some other language it is meant for human beings so that they can understand what is the meaning of life and they understand what is the purpose of life and how to lead this life that is the sanskriti and that is the importance of sanskrit to know it well as you as you just said sanskrit is not independent of dharma and that is what uh, makes the language so evolved now you know sanskrit non translatables carries a sense of urgency the word non translatables it carries a sense of assertion it carries a sense of non negotiability rajiv ji how was the idea for the book conceived and uh, how did you get around to collaborating with baba ji so the idea has been uh, emerging for 25 years uh, in different talks and in different works uh, and in the book being different which came out in two, about a decade ago uh, there are five major the question is what is the question being answered in the i'm addressing in that book is you know what makes our tradition different what makes the dharma different from other traditions like the abrahamic tradition and so on because i was dealing with this issue of a lot of gurus going around saying everything is the same all religions are the same gurus from ramakrishna mission to uh, this swami ji that swami ji i don't want to name them because it, i don't want to create that issue but major gurus from almost every major Uh, sampradaya it was t- in the fashion was how we are the same all religions are the same all dharma same and stuff like that and then when i would ask them why are you upset about conversion if they convert how is does it matter if everything is the same then who cares you should be happy there is one less religion if every all of them are same then if you if you get rid of it everybody become christian or muslim or whatever we solve the problem because this all the same and they wouldn't like that either but they could not put their finger on what what is different what is what matters so i started this project 25 years ago on developing ideas on what is different and this culminated in the book being different and there are five chapters each on a major topic major point of difference 
And uh, I won't go into discussion of that book. There is a lot written on it, a lot of videos on it, books available in Hindi also, in uh, in uh, Tamil also. Uh, I think in uh, it's also been Kannada, uh, Kannada, uh, Kannada language. So uh, one of the chapters was called Sanskrit Non-Translatables. So out of the variety of ways of explaining, one is philosophical, another is this behavior, attitude towards chaos and or versus organization, another is attitude towards history versus ahistoricity. So there are different ways of approaching difference. And so one of the ways of approaching difference is Sanskrit language itself. This was the largest chapter in that book. And, uh, and uh, so this people said, why, why don't you turn this into a separate book? Actually, the five main ideas of difference were supposed to be five different books. I was writing five books. And it, the publisher said, you know, you just go on writing these forever. You got to get them out. So why don't you just put them together, give one fifth space and do one book and get it out. And then the five different books can come later. And I never got around to that. So this particular one, I figured, OK, this can do a lot. This can this is easy because you can popularize these words. Uh, and and uh, the, the vision was uh, I, and then in the subsequent book, uh, uh, Sansk- the Battle for Sanskrit, again, I introduced this idea that I would really like a 108 words that have become part of the everybody's vocabulary in, in, among Indians first, and then we can spread it around. So every person who is English speaking and who has added these words into his vocabulary becomes an ambassador of our culture and our philosophy, our way of life, our Sanskriti. Through the Sanskritization of his own vocabulary, he becomes an ambassador. So you could learn only five words. That's all night. Fine. We are not saying you got to learn 108. You could learn two words. You could learn 50 words. Whatever you can learn is better than not having this vocabulary. So start with one word and then practice it. Watch the video, read the book, and it takes you no more than one hour per word. If between reading the book and watching the document, it takes no more than one hour per word. That's all you need to do once per week, and you have become an ambassador of Sanskriti. And that's very empowering for our people. Uh, so this is the idea how it started. And then the collaboration with Babaji, as I have mentioned earlier uh, in this d- discussion, was very strategic because I wanted a I wanted it to be a dialogue of uh, between people where I will bring in, okay, here is a word and here is what people are using it for. And I'm troubled. Please tell us more about it. Tell us its origin, its etymology, how it is used in Shastra. And we have a conversation. It is a conversation between Babaji and myself. And we decided to make documentaries on every single one of those words. And this would start as a documentary series. We would popularize it on YouTube and Facebook and all that. And through this, we will Sanskritize the English language. And then when the editing team started, uh, Anurag was one of those guys, uh, uh, Anurag Shastri, uh, uh, Sharma, Anurag Sharma in Delhi, and Manogna, uh, and, and several others, they were part of this project. And the conclusion was that, you know, uh, the, the documentaries are not self-explanatory. Some of them are, but it would be, not, let's, let's make a little book out of it. So we thought we'd do a little pamphlet. So it started as a project uh, that, okay, we'll, let's tr- transcribe all the documentaries. So we actually started with documentaries and make a, made a book out of it. So the team worked very hard. They went back and forth. Each time they would create a draft, it would go to Babaji, it would come to me, we would check it, change it and all that. And then we told the team, get some images, get some diagrams, put, make it more visual. So I would say that the, the people within Infinity Foundation, and we, I am glad to say we have close to 20 people working in USA and India, uh, paid staff full time. So the people in Infinity Foundation, because most of them are part of this, their own life has transformed because they're English speaking primarily and they've they've Sanskritized their language. So this is a this is we started as a movement by practicing. Uh, uh, And I learned this. I learned this in my own life. I learned that uh, when I take on uh, somebody who is using a word and so they're translating Shakti as energy. And I tell them that this uh, Shakti has personality, Shakti has the divine, Shakti is conscious, this electricity doesn't have, is not conscious. Electricity is not a, a, a intelligent, electricity is not a person. So each one of these can become a topic for dinner conversation, t- become a fireside con- uh, chat, uh, you know, when you're sitting in the holidays and talking to people. 
in the workplace when you're having lunch and uh, people want to talk you can introduce uh, you can you can either introduce such a topic or when somebody makes a mistranslation including a pandit we have so many pandits doing these uh, havans and yagnas in usa constantly mistranslating these words i mean they're using the <laughs> they're using sanskrit words replacing them with the, with the english incorrectly and uh, and there are acharyas talking like this also about soul and you know all of that kind of stuff so you as a as a ordinary person this book empowers you to raise your hand and say swami ji with all due respects i touch your feet you are great and all that but i don't think we can translate atman as, as soul and here is why and here you have to be able to say here is why and go back and forth the other person will say oh no no uh, we love all people everybody is great you can say nothing about that it is about the word has to be exactly what it means we can't translate like an apple can't be called an orange it doesn't mean you don't like oranges you like apple you like oranges but an apple is an apple and orange is an orange and the the whole prakriti is constructed on differences flowers are different animals are different birds seasons are different each individual is different the same way the different parts of the world the different civilizations had different experiences so our rishis had certain experiences and they we have words for them other people did not have the same rishis with the same experiences so they don't have those words and there's nothing chauvinistic by the way arabic has non translatables i acknowledge that chinese has the mandarin language has non translatables russian has non translatables french are very pakka certain words they don't want you to give up they want you to say it a certain way french actually have sued that champagne can only the it's a certain grape it grows in a certain region of france which requires certain soil and certain climate and certain water and that is champagne it cannot be something that any anybody else says okay this also champagne so we have to uh, we have to protect our culture through protecting the non translatables and this is a movement which i think can revolutionize the future of entire bharatiya sanskrit well uh, the conviction with which you speak about um, sanskrit in all its forms is truly admirable now let me take a detour and ask you when um, i think bollywood is one of the major sources of contamination of language if you ask me and i would believe that it is guilty of um, of also espousing urdu at the cost of sanskrit um would you agree with it number 1 and can bollywood ever wake up to the beauty of the sanskrit language in its dialogues and its um regular parlance uh me or baba ji whoever uh, would you like to take this so uh, baba baba ji what do you think of i think urduising urduising is another problem it's not just english baba ji it's also which is dekha jaye people like me in delhi we are, i'm guilty of this i was raised in a punjabi family in delhi ghar mein hum hindi bolte the but actually lot of the delhi hindi is urdu right school school mein hum english bolte the ghar mein hum hindi bolte the but that hindi is very urdu also so we you know just like uh, uh, being digested to english is a problem before that when the mughals came we got digested into urdu also so maybe baba ji you can say a little bit about that also and bollywood is actually a lot of urdu yeah because these days people you know they are very much fascinated by the movies and unfortunately before the movies were there there was you know some culture of reading books reading novels reading you know shastra also but now on tv and all these youtubes and all these things have become so common people don't study anymore even they don't read I, i'm sure to him knows this better than me because he's an author so people have you know given up this habit of reading they just want to watch and what they watch is mostly what is happening on the tv and it's not only bollywood but even the news if you hear or even the commentators of cricket you know cricket is people are mad after that you know so they are using the terminology which is not even pure hindi and i i noticed this that most people in india in north india i'm talking about where hindi is supposed to be spoken language you know i'm not talking about south and uh, they cannot speak one sentence or two sentence without utilizing english word forget about urdu 
I mean, Urdu has been here for a long time. I can understand, but English, you know, I, I don't see people speaking pure Hindi, even mixed with Urdu. There is, it is always mixed with English words. I notice this all the time. And when I speak Hindi and I don't use English words, they think that, you know, I'm speaking something else. Or they say that your Hindi is very high Hindi. You know? It's not high Hindi, it's just Hindi, not high or anything like that. So this, this is having, this Bollywood is especially having a very big influence on the, you know, vocabulary of people because these songs become very popular and people sing that and then they catch on to these words. And as we spoke about that, the one way we learn about words is what is called Riddha Vyavahara. You know, how others are utilizing the word. Many times people are using words, they don't know the meaning behind it especially the songs. They sing and if you ask what does it mean, they don't know, it just sounds good. That's all. And in the process, you know, our own Sanskrit language suffers. So this is the situation and Bollywood has a major role to play in this. So if Bollywood can actually collaborate with us, they can promote, you know, Sanskrit, they can promote Sanskriti, they can promote Dharma. You know, same thing can have good side and bad side. This is Amyoyascha Bhuta Nam. Anything which gives you disease can also cure. This is one of the principle of Ayurveda. Food has three functions according to Ayurveda. It nourishes you, it can cure your disease and it can make you sick. So same way, you know, Bollywood movies, they can make you improve your Sanskriti or they can degrade you. But unfortunately, it is only happening on the wrong side. Rajivji, why you've been very critical of uh, some of the Western scholars like Sheldon Pollock. Now, why exactly is Sheldon Pollock so dangerous to the Indian narrative? Number one. Number two, you talk about, um, you know, the modern day Kurukshetra. What exactly is this modern day Kurukshetra and who are the Kauravas, Kauravas today? Okay, so uh, Kaurava, one is uh, 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 Sheldon Pollock and his whole Paltan, which are part of India. Huge number of people in India. Uh, uh, Sheldon Pollock's uh, book, I responded in a big book called, uh, you know, The Battle for Sanskrit, uh, which explained why this hijacking Sanskrit, becoming the Adhikaris of Sanskrit, training the next generation of Indians to, who are Sanskrit speakers. They brought a lot of Indians into the United States given them PhDs with very great credentials, sent them back to India. So the next generation of people who are interpreting Sanskrit are trained by these Westerners. And this whole school of thought, which is which I call new Orientalism, new Orientalism, it's a return of Orientalism, which is sort of like praising Sanskrit, being very proud of it, saying I'm propagating it, but doing it with distortion. It is like, you know, you're putting a little poison uh, into your prasad and spreading the prasad and it's like slow death. It's a very, it's a poison that you don't feel, but eventually it will kill you. So this business of uh, distorting Sanskrit, translating it into useless, uh, meaningless words, uh, making it fo sound foolish, like uh, Professor Kapoor very eloquently explained, calling it a dead language, removing spirituality as something which is human rights abuser. Anything that is spiritual is called a Brahminical conspiracy and it's abusing human rights of people. All of that is part of this long agenda. And it was, I really felt I'm like the Chinese guy standing in front, a student standing in front of an army of tanks and saying, stop and taking that kind of on me. Because, you know, uh, the uh, Shingeri Sankracharya, uh, his administrative head had signed an MOU with the Columbia University to appoint them as the custodians and adhikaris of Adi Shankara's legacy in the United States and in the world. Uh, uh, with the uh, chairs, chairs being funded by Indians, Indians that funded a lot of chairs, a lot of money to fund these chairs and put uh, Sheldon Pollock as head of the committee who will appoint, who will come up with the prescription, to select the scholars. So in other words, he's sort of like the new Shankaracharya we appointed, the Western equivalent of a Shankaracharya. And why Shingeri would do that? So for me to take that on, take on, uh, I got hit by people in the United States, all these big rich, rich Indians in Wall Street who had funded it because they wanted to be in the good books of the American administration. They didn't like me because I derailed their project. The whole Shingeri Mutt administrator hated me. It's the Shankaracharya himself. I had to smuggle in through the side door to have an audience with him, unfiltered by anybody. 
And when the Shankaracharya himself heard it, he put it down and said, hell no, we're not going to. I mean, he didn't say those words, hell no. But what, what, he is a dignified person. But he, in effect, he said, he put his foot down and said, this won't happen. So it's a very big war, this war that we are on to. Now, regarding the Kurukshetra, I tell you, who, who are the who are the Kauravs? The Kauravs are not only the Marxists and leftists and the evangelists and the Islamists and all that. But I would say a very large percentage of the Hindus themselves are confused, they, including leaders, including political leaders, including our embassy, our Ministry of External Affairs. I have had arguments with the Indian Council of Social Science Research, which is part of the HRD Ministry or Education Ministry. I've had debates with them. They are using social sciences models, which are Western and, and Eurocentric models, which are actually undermining our Sanskriti and they're calling it you know, social sciences. So when you look at the intellectual apparatus of India, whether it is civil service, whether it is Indian Foreign Service, uh, whoever, it, you know, the courts, whether it is the media, even the people who are propagating Hinduism, there is a lot of confusion. It is well, the, they have good intentions, many of them. So I think the chorus that we have to fight are like all over the place. But the real question is, where are the Pandavas? That's the real question you should ask. Where are the Pandavas? That's the point. But good question. Thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, many of the readers are going to turn into Pandavas after reading your books. Now, finally, the last question. Now, for an entire, you know, generation of uh, Indians which have, who have grown up on Gandhi's ahimsa, believing that to be non-violence. Now, you seem to turn things around completely. You say ahimsa is not does not mean non-violence. Yes. What exactly does ahimsa mean? So firstly, ahimsa is the opposite of himsa. And himsa means harming, harming, causing harm. It's not just physical violence. You could cause harm verbally. You could steal somebody's money. You could be, you could culturally wipe them out by converting them. You could translate the Sanskrit non-translatable words into silly English equivalents and you've caused himsa. So you can digest people, their culture and their uniqueness and that is harm. That is himsa. So when you say a uh, himsa, it does not mean you want to eliminate harming because that may not be an option. Eliminating harming may not be an option, but you pick among the available options, you pick the one that is least harming. So, for example, if you kill bin Laden, if you kill bin Laden, you have committed violence. But that violence is to stop him from killing one lakh people. So what you've done is saved one lakh people by killing one. So Krishna... Krishna is actually promoting Ahimsa by saying you got to go and kill those people. So you see, the interesting thing is we say we say we should be practicing absolute non-violence. Ram does not practice absolute non-violence. He has to go and kill Ravana. Please notice that Krishna has to kill or advocate people to kill. So the avatars have to come and teach people that you have to kill sometimes. You have to commit violence in order to prevent bigger violence. So the, you are macro optimizing, you're not micro optimizing. So maybe in the micro level, one guy is going to be dead. But in the macro level, a whole society will survive because he's dead. This is what the this is why uh, uh, retract retreating into absolute nonviolence in the name of Ahimsa is a very bad idea. It's a defeatist idea. You get colonized. And when you get colonized, then for the next 200 years, millions of people will die. And so you have not committed ahimsa, you have committed himsa by failing to stand up as a uh, as an intellectual kshatriya. So the intellectual kshatriya has to take on battles, tough battles, controversial battles, put himself in the line of fire and sacrifice whatever, do his own tapasya. And so this is done in order to save the bigger cause, the bigger population. Uh, you have to macro optimize and not look at the micro whether I'm committing violence here or there. This is why ahimsa should not be translated as non-virus. Baba well, so Babaji should add to that. Well, I'll, you have spoken very nicely, Rajiv. I will just add that ahimsa, there is a sutra in Yoga Sutra which says ahimsa pratisthayam vairu tyagaha. It says that real ahimsa means that you give up vaira, means this feeling of hatred. It does not mean that you cannot kill somebody if that person is harming you, as he rightly said. Krishna himself says that dharma sansthapna arthaya sambhavami yuge yuge, that I come to establish dharma. For what he has to do two things, 
paritranaya sadhunam vinashacha duskritam so he is doing all he is protecting the dharmic people and he is eliminating the dharmic people he has to do violence but that violence is not considered as violence because he is doing this for the purpose of establishing dharma in other words as rajiv rightly said that you have to see what is the purpose of it ahimsa is not a goal in itself it's only a means so if it doesn't serve me then what is the point when mahatma gandhi was there was journalist western journalist asked him a question that suppose you are in a village and some people come with guns and they want to kill everybody and rape the women and take all the money what would you do he said i will come in the front first so how does that help they will kill him and they'll still do the same thing so that kind of non violence is not recommended and that's probably one of the reason that our kings thousand years ago forgot this teaching of bhagavad gita and they you know fell prey to the western forces so we should not make that mistake again very good point very good point well i'm so i'm so glad the your book sets the record straight on on the definition and understanding of ahimsa because um had our had our rulers followed your definition of ahimsa probably we would have got the better of our, some of our unfriendly neighbors a long time ago but i'm sure from here we're going to be more uh, astute and prudent in in following our age old traditions and sanskriti which we have lost track on and that is where i believe your book becomes all the more important because as baba ji had very clearly mentioned sanskrit is not independent of dharma and dharma you know is present everywhere whether it is politics whether it is the uh, futurist setting a futuristic vision for the country so it has been a wonderful experience talking with uh, rajiv ji and baba ji on this uh, wonderful book and i hope more and more youngsters and more and more people across the world read this book and get a better understanding of sanskrit of samskar and of our sanskriti thank you so much it was a pleasure talking to both of you thank you very much thank you thank you everybody wow that was a phenomenal session it has left us with a lot of food for thought and a doable plan of action This path-breaking book is a revolution which is now in your hands dear readers use it as a tool to encourage worlds to wake up to the vast knowledge that lies untapped until you embrace sanskrit but start from home speak with sanskrit words interspersed in conversations you hold with kids and families and friends and strangers and the world do it with pride be the cultural ambassadors please buy the book gift it to everyone you can as shri nikunj trivedi ji trivedi ji said it makes for a fantastic diwali gift thank you to him ji rajiv ji and baba ji and everyone who joined us today shubham huyat